Good evening, Highland Park. Thank you for joining us again as we continue our study in the book of Judges, chapter 18 today. We will continue on in our study. I'll pray and get us started, but just as a reminder, as always, please use that prayer list that Miss Amy sends out. and uh, Pray for those that need prayer and praise God for those that have received praises in their lives as well. Let's pray and we'll dig into chapter 18 today and continue the storyline that, that Chris actually talked about last week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. And thank you for another opportunity, Father, to, to start anew, to live a life that is obedient to you, that reflects your will in our lives. Another day is an opportunity, Father, to, to make you central in our lives to be aware of the things that would threaten to take centrality in our lives, Father, and the awareness and strength you provide to remove those idols from our lives. Father, thank you for the sacrifice of your Son that, that we can have communion with you and we can have communion with the brothers and sisters in faith. Father, we praise you and thank you. And Father, thank you for your word. You're inerrant, inspired, word, Father, that reveals to us your character and the truths that we are to live by. So, Father, we pray today that you would open our eyes and ears, that you would speak to us through the power of your word, Father, that you would impact and transform our lives for your glory and for your praise. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Chris, I'll start off with that. Thank you very much for last week and the four spiritual flaws. Um, great lesson plan, and what a great lesson last week to kick us off. And, and this week, our study in chapter 18 continues the storyline that Chris started for us last week. We'll talk more about Micah. We'll talk more about the priests that he has put in place and set up. If you recall... In last week's study, as Chris was walking us through this, we met a young Levite from Bethlehem in Judah who had left his hometown where he should have been serving his people. And he went in search of a place to stay. He had a, apparently a wandering heart to get out and to do things contrary to what God had set up and what God had planned. And when he meets Micah, one of the main players in our story last week, Micah sees an opportunity to make his, what do we call it, homemade, do-it-yourself kind of shrine more impressive, I guess, and he invites this Levite to stay on as a priest. And at that point, when the Levite agrees, Micah's shrine now at least outwardly conforms more to the basic rules that were set up in the Mosaic Law that priests had to be Levites if they were going to work at the temple service. And if you remember before, Micah had used his son. So at least outwardly now, his temple conforms. But the shrine itself at the heart rejects the basic principles of the very law that it visually confirms that worship must be conducted in accordance with God's standards and God's laws that he handed out, not in accord with human ideas. In Judges 17, 13, as Chris closed last week, it told us the very reason um, that Micah set up the shrine, the purpose behind all of his efforts. And what does it say to us? It says, Then Micah said, Now I know the Lord will prosper me, because I have a Levite as a priest. We can look at that and we know that all of Micah's efforts from the ephod, the, the carved images, and everything that he had done were done to get access to God so he could get God to do what he wants. True faith, brothers and sisters, we all know, will give God access to your heart so he can get us to do what he wants. Religion. A religion like Micah has will say, get God to serve you. But the gospel faith's message, the message that we preach says that the purpose of our faith is to get our hearts to serve him. 
and this tragedy that, that we see unfold in, in Judges 17, and we're going to see unfold even more in Judges 18 um, today, is that reducing God to someone that can be controlled or something that can be controlled, if you have a, an image, rather than seeing God as the one who is in control and worthy of all of our worship. It is just, it's a travesty when we take the creator of the universe the, who controls everything and we try to make him into something that we can control. And, and one of the themes that runs through this entire study, the, the lecture even last week that Chris did for us, is that anytime we re reduce God to something that's controllable with us, it will always leave us with a God that can never bless us, that can never help us, that can never save you. And that's the lesson that Micah finds out as we go into chapter 18. So grab your copy of God's Word if you would and follow along with me. I'll be reading from the ESV translation today. In Judges 18, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. And in those days the tribe of the people of Dan was seeking for itself an inheritance to dwell in. For until then, no inheritance among the tribes of Israel had fallen to them. So the people of Dan sent five able men from the whole number of their tribe, from Zorah and from Eshtal, to spy out the land and to explore it. And they said to them, Go and explore the land. And they came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and lodged there. When they were by the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. And they turned aside and said to him, Who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? What is your business here? And he said to them, This is how Micah dealt with me. He has hired me, and I have become his priest. And they said to him, Inquire of God, please, that we may know whether the journey on which we are seeking out will succeed, or we are setting out will succeed. And the priest said to them, Go in peace. The journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. Then the five men had departed and came to Laish and saw people who were there, how they lived in security after the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and unsuspecting, lacking nothing that is in the earth and possessing wealth, and how they were far from the Sidonians and had no dealings with anyone. And when they came to their brothers at Zorah and Eshtal, their brothers said to them, What do you report? They said, Arise, and let us go up against them, for we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. And will you do nothing? Do not be slow to go. Enter in and possess the land. And as you go in, you will come to an unsuspecting people. The land is spacious, for God has given it into your hands, a place where there is no lack of anything that is in the earth. So 600 men of the tribe of Dan, armed with weapons of war, set out from Zorah and Eshtal and went up and encamped at kiriath Jerim in Judah. On this account, that place is called Mahandan to this day. Behold, it is west of kiriath Jerim, And they passed from there to the hill country of Ephraim, and they came to the house of Micah. Then the five men who had gone to scout out the land of Laish said to their brothers, Do you know that in these houses there are an ephod? household gods, a carved image, and a metal image? Now therefore consider what you will do. And they turned aside, and they came to the house of the young Levite at the home of Micah, and asked him about his welfare. Now the six hundred men of the Danites, armed with their weapons of war, stood by the entrance of the gate. And the five men who had gone to scout out the land went up and entered and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, and the metal image, while the priest stood at the entrance of the gate with the six hundred men armed with weapons of war. And when these went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, and the metal image, the priest said to them, What are you doing? And they said to him, Keep quiet. Put your hand on your mouth and come with us, and be a father and a priest to us. It is better for you to be a priest to the house. Is it better for you to be a priest to the house of one man, or to be a priest to a tribe and clan in Israel. And the priest's heart was glad. He took the ephod and the household gods and the carved image and went along with the people. So they turned and departed, putting little one and livestock and the goods in front of them. 
And when they had gone a distance from the home of Micah, the men who were in the houses near Micah's house were called out, and they overtook the people of Dan. And they shouted to the people of Dan, who turned around and said to Micah, What is the matter with you that you have come with such company? And he said, You take my gods that I made, and the priest, and you go away, and what have I left? How then do you ask me, What is the matter with you? And the people of Dan said to him, Do not let your voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows fall upon you, and you lose your life with the lives of your household. Then the people of Dan went their way, and when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned back and went to his home. But the people of Dan took what Micah had made and the priest who belonged to him, and they came to Laish, to a people quiet and unsuspecting, and struck them with the edge of the sword and burned their city with fire. And there was no deliverer because it was far from Sidon, and they had no dealings with anyone. It was in the valley that belongs to Beth Rehob, and they rebuilt the city and lived in it. They named the city Dan after the name of their ancestor who was born to Israel. But the name of the city was Laish at first. And the people of Dan set up carved images for themselves. And Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. So they set up Micah's carved image that he had made as long as the house of God was in Shiloh. Quite a lengthy passage and, and full of so much in this, this narrative we read. But the first thing it points out is that Micah lived in a time in Israel when Israel had no king. That's what the very first verse says. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. At least, at the very least, they lived in a time where Israel had no king that they wanted to acknowledge. God was to be their king, but they didn't want to acknowledge it. And even though they, this verse doesn't say it, the implication is clear that they lived in a time where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And in these days, the tribe of Dan, according to verse 1 again, was seeking a place to call their own, at least to, according to verse 1, right? And I have to say when I read that, what? It, it, what is going on? And I hear your question, Lynn, as you're, as you're walking through this. How are the Danites still homeless, right? And I'm glad you asked. So let me, let me tell you, because this is a very interesting storyline that, that flows out through the rest of Scripture, and we get some information from First Chronicles all the way to Revelation. We'll get some information that will support this. Every other tribe, as we've walked through the book of Judges, has at least partially, partially I say, fulfilled the command that the Lord had given them. That they were to go forth, they were to take the land that the Lord had given him, um, that had been promised him. But the tribe of Dan, the Danites, had failed epically in this uh, promise that was given them. We go back to uh, Judges chapter 1 and look at verse 34 and what it says to us. And it says, The Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down into the plain. Not only did the Danites never take the land that the Lord their God had promised to them, but they were forced into the hill country and they lived this kind of semi-nomadic lifestyle, always roaming, never having a permanent house, and they lived in the mountains. The Danites, at the very get-go here, at the end of chapter 1, as we're talking about everybody going out, they didn't take the Lord at His word. They didn't take a step out in faith in in Judges chapter 1, as we just read, they instead were relegated off of the land. So now we find the Danites here, 17 chapters later at the beginning of chapter 18, searching for a land that they can kind of settle in. They want a land where they can plant, where they can harvest, where they can grow food and sustain themselves off the land. Understand the bigger picture of this whole story. In essence, the Danites rejected what God had planned for them and the land that God had purposed for them. And they are now searching for something that suits them. They're now searching for something that's right in their own eyes because the land 
that God had given them wasn't good enough for them. The Danites as a whole are a picture of the weakest clan or the weakest people that would call themselves children of God. So weak are they as a tribe that they are actually missing for the tribes that are listed of in the 144,000 in the book of Revelation. And if you remember in the book of Revelation, the, the angel ascending and he calls out and he, and he hears the number of those that are sealed from the tribes of Israel. And follow along with me and tell me if you hear the tribe of Dan mentioned. And he talks about it. It starts in verse 5. He says, 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of Gad were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of Asher were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of Levi. Uh, 12,000 from the tribe of Ishkar. 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulon. 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph. 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. Nowhere in there do you read about the tribe of Dan being part of the 144,000 that were sealed, that made it to heaven. And if you want more to back that up, because that is, is so insane, you have tribes in there that, that aren't even tribes, but you can go to First Chronicles, the first seven chapters, which traces the descendants of the 12 tribes, and you will not find the tribe of Dan listed in there. So... As a tribe, the men of Dan are like Micah for us. They both suffer because they haven't obeyed what the Lord, their God, has put down in front of them and mandated. And they both have an idolatrous view of God. They look at God as someone that they can manipulate. They ignore his word because he's already told them where their land was and he's already allotted their land for them, told them exactly where to live. And they go in pursuit of other land. And as they go in pursuit of this other land, they stop at Micah's shrine. And then the crazy thing in this story um, in Judges 18 is that they ask a Levite priest who should have been in Bethlehem and Judah to pray, to ask God whether their scouting party to a completely different land that God had given them, given them whether or not that land would be successful. Um, that is just absolutely mind-blowing. It's as if we're walking with our parents and our parents tell us to go up and, and turn right and we pray and go, hey, should I turn left? I want to know if I'm going to be successful. And we already know the direction that we need to go. Notice, though, that when they pray and the Levite asks them, um, he says, would you pray to God to see if we will be successful? They don't use the term that we're familiar with throughout the entire book of Judges, the Lord, in all caps, Yahweh. They use the term God, Elohim, as they speak to him and ask him to pray. But they get this assurance from a lost priest who's being disobedient to God, who's working in an idolatrous shrine with fake idols, and they find a land that they deem, ooh, this is great land. It's, uh, this is their own eyes telling them they have found a land flowing with milk and honey that they can take with their own power, and they don't have to rely on the Lord at all. Then the Danites, who refused to listen or trust Yahweh, decide that God, Elohim, has blessed them, and they go back to the tribe, they share the good news, and then they head off to take this land that, that they deem is worthy of them taking. And on the way, on the way back to this land, they stop at Micah's house and they, and they tell the rest of the troops, hey, do you know what's going on here? Do you know what we have here? And an epiphany pops in their head. And they say, well, if we're going out here, why don't we just take this religious shrine, the idols, the ephods, and the priest with us to our new home? So they go, they go into Micah's house, and they take everything that makes this shrine that Michael set up, Micah set up special. They take the, the ephod, they take the household god, the carved image, and the metal image, and they, they head off. The Levite 
as he's standing out next to the gate and they start walking by, he starts to challenge them and he asks them what they're doing. But they point out to him, look, is it better for you just to serve one man in one house or is it better for you to serve an entire tribe? And then the Levite, um, a little pride starts creeping into him. And we already know that he's not obedient to doing what he's calling. And verse 20 tells us, and the priest's heart was glad. This is a, a good step for him. He had filled up. So it, then the scripture says in verse 20, he took the ephod and the household gods and the carved image, and he went along with the people of his own free will. This is something that's great for him because in his eyes right now, he's not doing too bad. He had started out at the beginning of chapter 17, as Chris had pointed out to us, hopelessly wandering and homeless without a place to stay. And then he became a priest for one man in one house and had this small little shrine that's set up. And now he is the priest for an entire tribe. That's huge. That's quite the step up and quite the turn of events for this wayward, lost individual. But sadly, when we read that, even though we look at it and we jest, we, we can see just how lost this priest is and how deceived he has become. And he has become deceived by self-promotion. Because in actuality, he really only serves himself, right? Um, he looked for someone to take care of him, to find a place when he was homeless, and he's found the next bigger and better deal. He tells people exactly what they want to hear. Verse 6 says, And the priest said to them, Go in peace. The journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. I guess maybe there is some truth to that, because we know that God is always watching, but... If he was a true priest, he would know that the Danites had their own allotted land, the own space that God had allocated to them, and he would point them back to the land that God had given them and tell them to go and take the land. And he easily moves on to the next bigger, better deal with zero concern for the Lord's call on his life. And notice, please, how each and every decision that this priest makes takes him further and further and further away from the Lord. And, it, and it's a slow fade when you go from white to gray and you make those steps. You see, he started off as a Levite in the town of Bethlehem of Judah, the main tribe there, that's there, the strongest tribe. And the town of Bethlehem of Judah, that's going to be the epicenter of God's plans for his entire people. And he moves to the hill country of Ephraim, and he serves in an idolatrous shrine. And he is ultimately going to end up in Laish, which is outside the land that the Lord had given to his people. And he's working for a tribe that, according to Revelation 7, doesn't even reach heaven. So each and every decision that he has made as he's been disobedient to the call of the Lord on his life is taking him farther and further and further away from his calling. But in his eyes, he's huge. I mean, he is a big deal because he runs the worship for an entire tribe of God's chosen people. But in God's eyes, it's, it's hollow worship because it's focused solely on self-promotion. And actually, his worship is just just like Micah's, where he had left. You know, as the soldiers head out to the land that they decide to take for their, for their own, we find Micah and some of his neighbors who have, I guess, joined up to him in the neighborhood watch system to go back and help Micah attempt to get back everything that was pilfered for, from his house. And as Micah approaches him, he's at the point where he's ready to pop the top off a can of whoop on these people who have taken everything from him. And that's the reason that Micah is so upset. He says in Judges 18, verse 24, he says this to them, and he said, you take my gods that I made and the priest and go away, and what have I left? He says, you've taken everything from me. I'm upset. Everything, everything that Micah had had been taken from him, and he has nothing else. He has built up his entire religious life. He built up a shrine. He added to it. He built an ephod. He built an idol. Um, he even went out and hired a Levite and a priest. And the last verse 
of the chapter that Chris taught last week tells us he did all of this for a blessing. Listen to verse 13 out of chapter 17. And then Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. That's the entire reason he was doing everything. He wanted the Lord to prosper him. He wanted the Lord to rain blessings upon him. But hear this. Everything that Micah had put his trust in, the priest, the shrine, the ephod, the carved image, the metal image, was gone. And he couldn't get it back. Those that took the basis for all of his blessings were too strong for Micah to get his blessings and the basis for his blessings back. So scripture tells us that Micah just went home. And, and the point here for us, brothers and sisters, is that self-made religion is always going to disappoint. It doesn't matter who we make into our gods. It can be money, it can be relationships, it can be sports teams, uh, it can be our looks, our jobs, or even a reduced man-made version of God that we create and keep in, in a box. They will never deliver for us. I mean, Hugh Hefner and other abundantly wealthy people in history have proved it if they've asked them, how much money is enough? Just one more dollar. If money is your God, you are never going to be satisfied because you are never going to have enough. The person that makes relationships that are God and they worship their spouse or their significant other are always going to be disappointed because we are sinful human beings and we always err. The person that makes looks and their image, their God, are ultimately going to be disappointed because as they age, youthfulness goes away, and what used to be a head full of hair turns into a big old bald noggin. I know. So there's always disappointment. If we make anything our idol in place of the only sovereign God, and the only positive as I was reading through this that I can glean from any of this is that at least Micah found out and discovered the emptiness of his gods before he died. It wasn't too late for him. You see, sometimes people don't find this out about their false idols and what they worship until the time that they pass away, and it is too late once you have crossed over into death. This, this is also a good reminder for us. Everyone is... A worshiper. The only question we need to ask ourselves is, is who or what is it that we are worshiping? And what I mean is, what do you look for for ultimate meaning and purpose and blessing? Where does your focus go to? What one thing, what one thing that you had, if it was taken away with you, would provoke you to say, you took my God. What else do I have left? Just like Micah had said. You see, the one true Lord can never be taken away from us. He can't be moved. He is the one that we should join Peter. And Peter, as he cried out, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You see, when we find Jesus and we, and we develop that personal relationship with him, we find blessings. But we can only truly experience those blessings that are in Christ Jesus when we say to him, Jesus, without you, I have nothing because you are everything to me. We need to understand that there's nowhere else in life that we can turn to. If we know that Jesus is ultimately all that we have. <laughs> we will soon find out that he is eternally all we will ever need, and we will find our peace in that. Amen? Anyway, back to the text at hand as, as we walk through this 18th chapter. The Danites and their new priests, they continue on their journey, uh, on their trip to Laish, and they, as Judges 18.27 says, they strike them down with the edge of the sword, and they burn the city with fire. Then they rebuild the city after they burned it, and they settle there, and they rename it Dan. But it's actually still called Laish because it was never part 
of Dan's inheritance from the Lord. Grasp the magnitude of all this as we read this story, just from a, a high-level overview as we go through it. Dan is a tribe that was born into God's people in Israel, right? But they now live outside of God's land. They don't listen to God and what God has in store for them, but instead they go after what they want. And to top it all off, they worship him in a manner that is diametrically opposed to the commands that he has given them. But it gets even worse. This last part that I'm going to share with you is kind of like a sucker punch uh, that comes at you from left field. To the entirety of the story, as Chris was uh, so, so gracious to teach us last week, and through this, we have never heard the name of the Levite, the priest that served. But listen to what Judges 18.30 says. It says, And the people of Dan set up the carved images for themselves, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the Danites until the day of the captivity into the land. Let that settle in for just a moment. The text says, the scripture says, the word of God says that Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Moses, that right there took the wind out of my sails. That was the point that hit me. You know, the, the Levite that is willing to compromise on everything is, except his own personal entrance, interests is none other than a descendant of Moses. Moses, the prophet who there is none other. Moses, to whom God spoke face to face. Moses, who led Israel out of captivity. And that is proof for us right there, brothers and sisters in Christ, that God does not have grandchildren. Each and every individual has got to find God personally. No one is related to God by family tree. There is no tribe or, or no church member either that is related to God by their pedigree or by their parents' standings in the church. In fact, we've seen exactly the opposite with each generation that has passed in the book of Judges as we've walked through it, has we not? We have seen each generation fall farther and farther from the grace of God and from obedience to the God that brought them in there. You know, I read this somewhere and I can't remember, and I hope I have this correct. One generation knows the gospel. The next generation assumes the gospel. And the third generation loses the gospel. And you don't see that any clearer in Scripture anywhere except where it talks right here about Moses' family. But regardless, Jonathan and his family and his sons continue to worship idols, worshiping the Lord in name, but not in truth. Dan, ultimately, this place where they have set this up, ends up as the idol worship once the nation of Israel has split into two kingdoms. Listen to what later on, as, we, as you walk through the narrative in 1 Kings chapter 12. Listen to verses 26 through 30. Um, Jeroboam had split off. Um, the land that he controlled at this point did not have God's approved site for worship. And his concern was if that his people, as he was king of his kingdom, were to travel back to the right site to worship the Lord, then their hearts would be turned back to the Lord and that he would lose his kingdom and his people. So this is what it says in 1 Kings 12, 26 through 30. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. If, his pe if this people go up to offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, at Jerusalem, where the sacrifices were supposed to be offered, he says, Then the heart of his people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me in return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. That's familiar to us, right? And he said to the people, You have gone 
up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and here it is, and he put the other in Dan. And verse 30 uh, of those verses says, And this became a sin for the people, for the people went as far as Dan to be before one of these false idols. But the good thing is that we find here that this that is set up in the book of Judges, it doesn't last forever. According to scripture here, he says that his sons, the priests to the tribe of the Danites, until the day of captivity of the land, until the time that they were carted off, it doesn't last forever. It go, only goes that far. So I guess in the same manner that the Danites took the idols from Micah, the Lord will take the land from them. What should, as, as we've gone through this, this crazy text, and it gets worse in the next few weeks, trust me, but what should Micah and Dan have done? On this last verse, it says that they set up Micah's carved images that he has made as long as the house of God was in Shiloh. As long as the house of God was there, they set up carved images. Praise be that we serve a God now that made it possible for people to approach him, to worship him, to know him, and to abide with him. The tabernacle, the place of God's presence among his people was in Shiloh, and that should have been the focal of Micah and the Danites' lives. Regardless of where they settled, they should have traversed back to the spot and the place that God ordained that he would be worshipped, and they should have worshipped him in the right manner. The same thing should hold true for us today um, of God's tabernacle for us, the man who literally is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us, that tabernacled among us. If we as children of God, felt to center our lives on Jesus as the way to approach worship, uh, on the way to know how to live in accordance with God's will for our lives, then we're going to center our lives on man-made religion. We're going to center and focus our lives on, on idols, on something that is never going to bless us, on something that is going to lead us down the wrong path. You know, these two chapters... Chapter 17 last week and chapter 18 this week. Um, shed some light on evil. Evil doesn't always make people violent and wicked, though that might be interesting here, because evil, when it does that, has a tendency to wake people up. It has a tendency to cause people to step back. Instead, evil has a tendency to make us hollow on the inside. Um, externally, we're like all proper and nice and yes, ma'am, no, sir. Oh, I'm doing great. Everything is fantastic. But underneath, it's an all-out brawl. It's a race to, to get ahead. It's, it's the pursuit of power or, or personal ego. You know, we walk all over each other underneath, just as Micah was walked on by the Danites and the Levite. And least we forget and go, oh, poor Micah and everything that he went through. You think back to the lesson last week where he taught about Micah. Micah was the one that attempted to walk on his own mother and robbed her of everything that she had had before men came along and ultimately robbed him. And brothers and sisters, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this. We can all fall into this same trap if we insist on making God in our image. If the world continues to twist Scripture and to twist the words of the Bible to fit into what they believe it means today, we're going to fall into the same fate. And the only way out of that is by worshiping God, coming to the house of the Lord, the tabernacle, Christ Jesus, the man who was made flesh and tabernacled among us, because he is the only one that has the words of eternal life. Every other God that we put on that pedestal in our life will lead us down a path we do not want to go. So focus your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Amen. Thank you for joining us tonight. Look forward to seeing you this Sunday. And remember, one worship 
be on the lookout. Koinonia Cafe opens at 9.45 a.m. Come in and get you some free coffee, some free tea. And yes, there are decaf coffee, decaf tea. We even have water and we'll have some pastries for you. Love you all and I'll see you then. Have a great day.